Well, thank you for being so well behaved. The crowd quietened to signal to me it was time to start. I love it. I love it. Yes, yeah, so far. So far, exactly. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm Sally Cap. I'm the Lord Mayor of Melbourne. It's lovely to have you here at Town Hall for tonight's Transport and State Election Forum. This event has become an important part of the pre-election community discussions, and it is on a very important topic, of course. And uh, I feel uh, very lucky to be taking uh, some leadership tonight, but actually this forum is organised by the Metropolitan Transport Forum. I see so many of the members here this evening. Thank you so much for your loyal and dedicated work on this important topic. And of course, the MTF represents 26 Melbourne councils on transport issues. Uh, I begin tonight by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we govern, the uh, Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung and the Bunurong Boon Wurrung peoples, and we pay our respects to their elders, past and present. We acknowledge and honour the unbroken spiritual, cultural and political connection uh, that our traditional custodians have to this unique place, uh, their care for country uh, for more than 2,000 generations. We have uh, very special panel members tonight uh, and we're so delighted that they accepted the invitation again. I remember the forum in 2018. It was so much fun. It was dramatic. There was theatre. Uh, no pressure. We're hoping for lots of that tonight. Uh, and uh, we're really delighted to have um, the Honourable Jacinta Allen, Deputy Premier and Minister for Transport and Infrastructure, Dr Matthew Buck, the Shadow Minister for Transport and Infrastructure, and Sam Hibbins, the Green Spokesperson for Transport. I get to say a few things. Um, Greg's going to bell me when I've run out of my time, as he will all of us this evening. Uh, but we wanted to say that Melbourne, Greater Melbourne, and of course Victoria, we really are at a turning point following the disruption of the pandemic. Our city alone is set to deliver a $150 billion gross local product by 2031, which is a 70 per cent increase on 2019. Quite stunning, stunning if we get all our settings right. Greater Melbourne is on track to be the nation's most populous city by 2027 and home to more than 600,000 jobs. Uh, which is an increase of more than 100,000 on pre-pandemic, so some wonderful opportunities ahead. And of course, even during COVID, all of us in this room played a role in planning for the future, regardless of the crisis that confronted us every day. And transport was absolutely at the heart uh, of all of those plans. Every extra person, I say, uh, coming into our city adds to the buzz, but of course, it's all of our neighbourhoods. Uh, and as you may have read um, in many different forums, the City of Melbourne, like many other municipalities, we are uh, always looking at that important balancing act to ensure that all modes of transport are optimised and supported as we continue to grow into the future. For us, it is about delivering on our transport strategy 2030. Um, but the Melbourne Transport Forum uh, is a, a group of leaders that really recognise that successful cities and sustainable communities are built on high quality transport connections. That's why we work so hard. We know that COVID has changed the rhythm uh, of our uh, Greater Melbourne and our state. It's accelerated trends such as bikes and micromobility. We saw cycling uh, outside our central city um, surge by 200% during the pandemic. And based on current trends, by 2030, one third of vehicles on our city roads will be bicycles. And yet, as we say, uh, less than 1% of our road space is dedicated to protected bicycle lanes. Public transport, of course, is still the choice for the majority. And uh, we note some of the COVID caution at the moment. I know we're all working hard to overcome that and build it into COVID confidence on public transport because it plays such a vital role. Uh, and our independent uh, transport uh, review told us that the demand for public transport will continue to rise as we see a decline in car use into the future. We know that public transport has the capacity to move more people around our city and around our state. Um, at the same time, um, we recognise the importance of walkability uh, for us in the city. That uh, is something that's quite striking because 90% of the trips 
done around our CBD are done by foot. So it's a very important issue for us. And as I mentioned all earlier, there are three municipalities involved in the trial for e-scooters, over one million rides so far. Absolutely extraordinary. And I think the popularity of this mode of transport is undeniable and adds another really interesting element to the mix of how we balance our transport modes. Of course, the purpose of tonight's forum is for all of you, uh, our community, to be able to listen uh, firsthand to leaders uh, from each of our major parties on these important issues, the vision for transport uh, and practical issues as we move forward and, in, and into the long term. It's an opportunity not just to listen but also to ask questions and thank you for all of the pre-submitted questions this evening. But we will start with questions from the floor so please feel uh, prepared and enthusiastic about joining in the discussion this evening. Now, we've got some ground rules, of course. I've come to the boring bit, so bear with me, assuming that my prior bit was so interesting, of course. Uh, we, um, now, to meet the aims of hearing from everybody and having lots of question time, this is how it will go. Each speaker will have eight minutes uh, to uh, make a presentation and uh, there will be a bell sound at 30 seconds and then two of those at eight minutes, and at that time we'd just ask you to finalise your presentation. If you could, please, uh, and uh, that would leave us with about 40 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes for Q&A, so looking forward to that. Um, to ensure that we do get through as many questions as possible, if you can limit your question to a minute, that would be great. Um, we'd like to avoid duplication of questions if we can, so uh, if you hear your question asked, please don't ask it again. That would be fantastic. Um, we do have microphones uh, to queue, or we can bring microphones to you, whichever suits you best, uh, so please do let us know. Uh, and if your question remains unasked, uh, you can email it to the uh, Transport Forum and we will endeavour to have responses from uh, our three representatives back to you in a reasonable time frame. And uh, I know we're all looking forward to a fantastic evening. Uh, so without further ado, let me please introduce our first speaker in a more fulsome way. We have the Honourable Jacinta Allen, Deputy Premier and Minister for Transport, Infrastructure, Suburban Rail Loop and the Commonwealth Games Delivery. Jacinta was elected to Parliament in 1999 and is the longest serving female minister in Australia's history. I did not know that. And Victoria's longest serving Labor minister. And, and she has the responsibility of overseeing the biggest investment in transport infrastructure in generations. Jacinta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and uh, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting on and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And it's terrific to be here tonight again, four years later, for the, uh, for the discussion tonight at Melbourne Town Hall. And of course, the Town Hall is the site of one of the five new train stations that are under construction as part of the Metro Tunnel project. And in a couple of years' time, you'll be able to walk downstairs and catch a train uh, to, uh, as part of the new project and in a few years after that, that train will be able to take you through to the airport. The Metro Tunnel Melbourne Airport Rail projects are just two of the 165 road and rail projects that make up Victoria's big build and they're right across the state, from the train station right in the heart of the city all the way up to the river with the brand new Echuca Moama Bridge. All 165 projects are about improved connections, improved safety, reduced travel time, giving people fast and convenient access to jobs and services they need. Also importantly too, they're helping support uh, at the economy, particularly in this post-pandemic period. And this was reinforced on Monday with the release of Comsec State of the State report that had Victoria as the top state and underscored the importance of construction in contributing to uh, the job creation in our state. Now, back in uh, 2014, many doubted our ability when we made the commitment to remove 50 level crossings in eight years, and that was fair enough, because only seven had been removed in the previous uh, decade. So that pessimism was understandable. Many transport and infrastructure projects that the city and state needed had been long talked about but never delivered. Last week, I was very proud to be in the western suburbs celebrating the removal of the 65th level crossing in just over seven years. And now when we talk 
about removing a level crossing. The discussion is not focused on if it will be removed, it's how it's going to be removed. And this is a big and fundamental shift in the community's perception of infrastructure projects. And in each of these locations across all of our projects, we've worked with local communities to find local solutions and also opportunities to not just remove a level crossing, but also to make a lasting difference in those communities. Now, invariably, the delivery of projects like this come with some criticism. And I think back to when we started the Metro Tunnel project all those years ago, it was suggested that an $11 billion uh, project was a lot of money to get from Melbourne Grammar to Melbourne University. When we announced Skyrail on the Dandenong line between Caulfield to Dandenong, we were attacked from all angles. It was going to be noisy, it was going to divide communities, it was going to be unsafe. But what we've demonstrated over the journey is that when you work alongside the community, listen to the community to deliver these projects, these criticisms do start to dissipate as the project reaches its completion. Skyrail was finished, that original Skyrail project was finished uh, more than, uh, no, just on four years ago. But I still to this day get emails saying, I was originally opposed to this, but now it's built, it's fantastic. So there'll always be opposition to projects and there'll always be a broad range of views about design and priorities. And that's great. Tonight is about that. It's about having ideas, having a debate, having a discussion, and I certainly welcome that. But what we will never do in the Andrews Labor government is, unlike our opponents, is use these, uh, these challenges as an excuse for inaction. There are those who say we should abandon projects that Victorians have voted for, the North East Link, scrap the suburban rail loop. There are those that are opposed to our Melbourne Airport Rail project. And opposition continues to protest against level crossing removal projects across the city in places like Surrey Hills, Parkdale and Ringwood. And this is a fundamental difference between the approach of our government and the approach of previous governments. Promising to build infrastructure is the easy bit. Seeing it through, rising to the challenges, getting it done is the challenging part and it's the challenge that we have risen to. And when you're building 165 major projects, of course there will be challenges and as I said before, we will not use these challenges as an excuse to abandon projects and break election commitments. And there's no doubt cost of delivery is one of those challenges and we have been completely upfront where there have been cost and time challenges on some of our projects. But there are also so many more projects that have been delivered under budget and ahead of schedule and two recent examples of this is uh, being level crossing removals again and the recent Cranbourne line duplication. Both a year ahead of schedule and we returned hundreds of millions of dollars into the budget back in May from these projects. But also too tonight, I wanted to focus for a few moments on the suburbs and, uh, and last Saturday was a bit of a wet old day, but we had seven, 650 people turn up to a thank you event for the uh, completion of the Clyde Road uh, level crossing removal project at Berwick because the community were thrilled with the delivery of that project. And why were they? Quite simply, it cuts their travel times, it made their streets more safer, it made sense for that level crossing to be removed. And on a much bigger scale, that's what the suburban rail loop is about. It simply makes sense to build an orbital rail line around our city, to slash travel times, take cars off roads and create tens of thousands of jobs. It makes our universities more accessible that were once inaccessible for, and make it a real option for school leavers. And SRL isn't just a project we need for the future, it's a project Victorians want right now. And we know um, Victorians support the suburban rail loop, they understand why it's needed, and they voted for it at both fed federal and state elections. And only an Andrews Labor government will deliver this project, and I'm so proud to say that work is underway right now. It's also been, the suburban rail loop, been through a comprehensive pl pro planning process, one of the most comprehensively planned transport projects in history, a strategic assessment, a business and investment case, through, and also it's going through one of the most rigorous planning and environmental approvals processes ever undertaken in our state. It's also been, too been supported uh, by other bodies. Infrastructure Victoria have included it in their 30 year strategy and Infrastructure Australia have put it on their priority list. It's a project that stacks up and that's certainly what is made clear in our business case. Now we know again there are some that oppose this project and the Liberal opposition have responded to these concerns by saying they will scrap the project. 
Bold, ambitious city shaping projects will always attract critics. The city loop did, the metro tunnel did, and we're seeing that with the suburban rail loop. And as I said, we're happy to engage in the debate, but what we won't do is break election commitments for major projects that have been endorsed by Victorians. Now, four months out, uh, we've only got four months to go to the state election, and the only commitment our opponents have made in the transport infrastructure area is to review and audit every single major transport project. And we know from lived experience what that means. When the Liberal Party say audit, projects get cut. That means projects will stop, construction will stop, jobs will stop, and it'll hit our economy. And that's where I just want to leave you with one more fact about our transport infrastructure investment. For every 100 jobs you see on our construction site, for every 100 jobs in high vis on those construction sites, another 200 jobs are supported across our economy. Pay packets going home to families each and every week. So in finishing, I've got a question for the Liberal Opposition representative here tonight. The Andrews Labor Government announced the suburban rail loop four years ago. You and the Liberal Party have had four years to think about this project. Yes or no, do you support the suburban rail loop? That's the question the Liberal Opposition needs to answer tonight. Thanks for the opportunity to join this debate. Thank you, Jacinta. Well, from one of our most experienced parliamentarians to one of our newest, uh, Dr Matthew Buck, who is the Shadow Minister for Transport Infrastructure, Youth Affairs, Child Protection and Youth Justice. Matthew was appointed a member of the Legislative Council for Eastern Metropolitan in March 2020. Matthew has a PhD in history from the University of Melbourne and has experience in politics in the UK as well. Welcome to the stage, Matthew. Well, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Also, thank you to the Forum for the uh, very kind invitation to be here. It's great to follow uh, the Deputy Premier and also to be here with the, the Greens spokesperson uh, as well. Uh, I must acknowledge the traditional owners of the land as, as we start. Uh, the Lord Mayor um, asked me in particular um, to address um, our vision, my party's vision, the Liberal Party's vision for transport infrastructure and transport planning especially over the period of the next four years, should we have the great privilege of winning the election in November. And certainly, my vision is to ensure that Victoria has the transport infrastructure that it needs and to minimise waste. To do this, my view is that we need to make transport planning boring again. Uh, there are big challenges, as the Deputy Premier said, across transport planning and the delivery of transport infrastructure. In addition to the, to the challenges quite correctly identified by the Deputy Premier, I'd point to challenges across the globe. We find ourselves in an inflationary environment. We've recently had uh, a budget handed down in the EU with uh, massive stimulus. There's been massive stimulatory infrastructure spending in uh, the US under President Biden, also in China. Every single Australian jurisdiction has a very significant transport infrastructure pipeline. This is placing massive pressure uh, on supply pipelines. There are huge labour challenges as well. And, and this is something that um, the Victorian government has acknowledged. I was interested in some comments by the Treasurer, Mr Pallas, which I agreed with, directly after last budget. He said this, we'll have to, over time, make a value judgment about exactly how quickly we can deliver on projects. The industry is demonstrating signs of stress, Mr Pallas said, both in terms of competitive capacity, skills, and in terms of resources availability. Where the government has made commitments around timelines, we try as best we can. Quite frankly, we're starting to get a better appreciation of how to deal with these projects and how to manage them. So I agree with the Deputy Premier. There are big challenges. I also agree that these challenges must not be used to delay important decisions about what comes next, but also to delay the, any number of significant projects that are currently underway. <clears throat> I believe that in this environment, the best way forward 
is to work collaboratively with the experts in Infrastructure Victoria, Infrastructure Australia, so many in our councils and many people in this room to deliver projects that we know stack up, for which there is evidence, and that I am told so oftentimes by you and by other experts can deliver massive benefits both for Victorian commuters, first and foremost, but also for Victorian taxpayers. I'm talking about projects that involve <coughs> rail and tram line extensions, uh, electrification, uh, duplication, um, changes and reforms to signalling patterns, reviewing timetables and routes, especially when it comes to our bus network, especially when it comes to our bus network. But to do all of this, and to do all of this most effectively, Victoria desperately needs an integrated transport plan. Now, we don't currently have an integrated transport plan, and this is something that the Auditor-General has highlighted, as many of you will know. The Auditor-General said recently that um, the government's failure to put in place an integrated transport plan, and I'll quote him, creates risks of missed opportunities to sequence and optimise the benefits of these investments to best meet Victoria's transport needs. The Grattan Institute has also had some instructive things to say about the fact that Victoria does not have an integrated transport plan. It's repeatedly drawn attention to the fact that that failure is one of the driving forces behind project delays and cost overruns. And so a key priority, a key priority of a Liberal and National Government, should we be so successful and honoured to form one after November's election, would be to put in place an integrated transport plan. And, and there are so many fantastic projects that, of course, need to go through a proper process, including through Infrastructure Australia, but, on my analysis, would deliver significant benefit for our state. Projects like uh, Metro 2, like the OMR, the BIFT and the WIFT, like the Deputy Premier, I spent a significant amount of time last week in the western suburbs and I went with local councillors in Melton to visit the site of the WIFT. Uh, the Western Rail Plan has much merit, but, of course, there are economic and budgetary constraints. And how do we make decisions about what comes next and sequencing? Well, my view, and if this is different to the view of others, so be it, is that in government we need much input from the transport and planning experts, especially at Infrastructure Victoria, that this government, to its credit, established, also at Infrastructure Australia. Now, now my, my personal view, and again, this may be different from the view of others, is that there is much that we should be able to agree upon in the transport infrastructure portfolio. We all agree on the need to continue uh, to pursue an agenda of, of mode shifting. Uh, I would have thought, I would hope that we all agree that there's a great need to reduce car dependency, and I know this will be a topic of our discussions shortly. There are many projects that are currently underway that have been pursued by this government that I and the Liberal Party wholeheartedly support. It's a great thing that we continue to see level crossing removals. Uh, I support the uh, Metro project. It's a very good project. It will deliver significant benefit for our state the North East Link, airport rail. These are good projects. Now, I have been critical, and I will continue to be critical, of several elements of the management of these projects. I'll continue to be critical, as the Auditor General has been critical, of cost overruns and some of the preventable reasons for those oftentimes massive cost overruns. But the projects themselves, despite what you may hear elsewhere, have full bipartisan support. I have concerns to come to the direct question asked of me by the Deputy Premier regarding the suburban rail loop. Now, the Liberal Party and the National Party have taken a thoroughly constructive approach to the suburban rail loop. We did not stand in the way of the legislation in Parliament that was needed to establish the loop authority. And right from the outset, upon having the honour of taking on this portfolio some months ago, I expressed my deep concerns about the planning of the suburban rail loop Indeed, just this afternoon, some articles appeared in the media that highlighted the fact that, quite remarkably, the business case for the suburban rail loop 
has never been sent by the government to Infrastructure Australia for independent analysis. And so I'll continue to say that I have deep concerns about the suburban rail loop, that I won't sign a blank cheque for the suburban rail loop, given that experts say that it is now likely to cost, if completed in, say, the 2050s sometime, about double what the government estimated when it announced this project with much fanfare on Facebook 1,432 days ago. I'd welcome the opportunity, albeit there isn't time now, <laughs> to talk further uh, about that. Thank you so much for having me along tonight. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Great to hear from you. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have our representative from uh, the Green, Sam Hibbins, who is the state member for Paran and the Green spokesperson for Transport. Sam's other portfolios include LGBTIQ equality, major events, youth and education. He was first elected to represent Paran in 2014, and along with Ellen Sandell here in Melbourne, they became the first Greens uh, representatives in the lower house in the Victorian Parliament. Uh, welcome to the stage, Sam. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor. And can I also start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on and pay my respects to Elders past and present and also put forward my support for treaty and truth-telling here in Victoria to help heal the wrongs of the past and to truly achieve reconciliation. Thank you to uh, the Metropolitan Transport Forum for putting on tonight and the City of Melbourne for hosting. You know, local councils, local councillors have been doing some really terrific work uh, in transport. Uh, I've been really impressed by the integrated transport plans that councils uh, right across uh, Melbourne uh, have been developing. Uh, I've really been impressed to see councils again right across uh, Melbourne here in the CBD but also across wider Melbourne taking the lead on active transport infrastructure. You know we're really seeing some good uh, bike and, and pedestrian infrastructure being rolled uh, right out uh, across across the city and uh, according to all news reports Mayor it's all going swimmingly I think so no I'll, I'll have a bit more to say on that later. Um, look I come with a very clear message when it comes to transport. Uh, transport is Victoria's biggest growing source of carbon emissions and while just about every other uh, area when it comes to emissions is going down, transport uh, continues to rise uh, and is forecast to do so. Uh, it currently equates to around a quarter, 25% of Victoria's total emissions, uh, second only to our coal-fired power stations. Uh, and in fact, emissions from transport uh, is roughly the equivalent to one, one of Victoria's coal-fired power stations. So it's not small fry. And by far and away the biggest uh, contribution uh, to emissions and transport, 90% uh, is fossil fuelled powered petrol cars and trucks. So to tackle the climate crisis here in Victoria, uh, we need to rapidly cut emissions from the transport sector. And at the heart, at the heart of our transport policies, the state government needs to support people to make the shift uh, out of their polluting petrol vehicles and into cleaner, cheaper, climate friendly forms of transport. And tonight, I want to put to just Four, put on four solutions, four solutions on the table. It's not, not everything, but I think four solutions that would make uh, certainly a, a very big difference. Uh, one is a clear and legislated clean transport action plan uh, that should cover uh, what the government already uh, is legislated to do under the Transport Integration Act uh, in terms of developing and pub or publishing a transport plan for the state. Uh, they are required to develop one. Uh, I tried to move uh, amendments in the upper house the Greens did to get them to publish that, but unfortunately uh, the government voted that down. But it also should go further uh, and set mandated targets for emissions reductions and also uh, legislated mode share targets to increase the uptake of climate friendly modes of transport. Because without that, we're seeing billions of dollars uh, spent on infrastructure and certainly I think we all welcome the fact uh, that we are seeing uh, far more being spent on infrastructure than the previous government but we're seeing uh, projects that are putting thousands of more cars on the road, uh, 200 kilometres of newer widened freeways that are locking in carbon emissions for the future, and that certainly is not compatible with dealing with the climate crisis. 
the second solution I want to put on the table is increasing the frequency of our existing public transport networks, and that's particularly throughout the day and on the weekends. Uh, if you look across the day and on the weekends, you've got waits of around 20 minutes for a train, 15 for a tram, buses, goodness, half an hour, an hour, even more, and that's just not acceptable for a world-class city. It's a major barrier to use and certainly a major barrier uh, for people who want to use public transport just to get around, not necessarily uh, in and out of the city during peak hour, but just to get, a, get around and, you know, take the kids to school, uh, do the shopping, perhaps some, some uh, shift work. It's just not compatible with that. Uh, and it's not a, that's not a question of infrastructure. You don't need massive new infrastructure to run more trains and trams and buses throughout the day. Uh, it's about the funding. Uh, and we, we got it costed up by the PBO some time ago and increasing trains and trams to just about the 10-minute standard would be around $200 million a year. So it's a question of uh, funding and operational funding, uh, not necessarily building new infrastructure. Uh, third solution I want to put on the table is increasing the uptake of electric, electric vehicles. That includes electric buses and e-bikes. Victoria's got about 5 million cars, 5 million cars and trucks on our roads. We've got some of the most polluting climate damaging vehicles in the world on our streets and in our neighbourhoods. Uh, about a million of them, are in fact, are over 15 years old. Uh, they've got the lowest possible pollution standards. In fact, the average age of a car in Victoria is over 10 years old. That means we need a clear date for the end of new fossil fuel car sales. Uh, the Greens Labor government and the ACD, ACT has set a target for 2035, the first state or territory in Australia to do so. Uh, and certainly we need, certainly over the next five years, when the price between an electric vehicle and a petrol car is so great, we need significant subsidies uh, to reduce the barriers for the uptake of EVs. Uh, and we certainly don't need a new tax on electric vehicles. That will be just another barrier uh, to owning an EV when already there's cost, there's the, the lack of range of models, there's the charging. This tax is yet another barrier. Uh, when the Treasurer introduced it, he promised that every other state would be on board, but Victoria has now been left on a rock and is going it alone. There's been some really good initiatives that's been introduced uh, overseas. In New Zealand, the Greens Labor government have introduced a fee-bait system that lowers, lowers the cost of an EV. Also a scrap and replace scheme for people on lower incomes that get the most polluting cars off the road and replace them with an EV. Uh, we've got subsidies for electric bikes in Europe. Uh, we've got um, you know, New South Wales and other countries rapidly uh, increasing the number of electric buses, uh, but we're getting, getting uh, left behind in Victoria, not taking up the opportunity that electric buses bring. Uh, fourth solution I want to put on the table is a massive increase in the funding for active transport. Currently Victoria sits at about, uh, I think it's about 1% of our entire capital spend on riding a bike and walking. Uh, in places uh, where the Greens are in government, uh, as part of their shared power uh, agreements in uh, places like Ireland and Scotland, uh, that's included in that agreement a massive increase in funding for walk in, walking and cycling, uh, 10 to 20 per cent of the total capital spend on transport. And that would mean hundreds of kilometres of separated bike lanes, safer pedestrian crossings, wider footpaths, more public space, uh, you know, better access to tram, tram stops and train stations. And I know there's been a, uh, an attempt to run uh, a negative campaign against bike lanes uh, here in the CBD and across the city. But I'll tell you what's not acceptable, and that is the status quo. That is not acceptable. Uh, and we're seeing a real increase in uh, deaths uh, of cyclists and pedestrians in the last 12 months. Certainly that's not acceptable. Uh, and we need uh, increased funding uh, in uh, cycling and pedestrian infrastructure uh, to address that and to really create a sustainable city. Uh, so I'll conclude there. And what I've put forward, uh, yes, it'll cut emissions, but it'll also go to addressing the cost of living crisis that we're uh, facing at the moment. Uh, we need to, uh, so many people or so many areas, particularly out in the suburbs, are locked into expensive uh, car ownership. Uh, it would um, help with reducing air pollution. Uh, we've got an air pollution crisis as well. And again, that really does affect uh, inordinately people from uh, vulnerable people, people from lower income backgrounds as well. So this is just as much about social justice as it is about our climate. Uh, and plus, it'll just make it easier to get around our city uh, and make our city and our state an even better place to live. Thank you. They're arguing already up here. This is awesome. 
All right, it is question time. If you have a question, could you please make your way to the microphone here? And we'll start a bit of a queue, uh, remembering that it's just one minute to ask the question. And panellists, if I can get your attention for a moment, uh, you've got a maximum of two minutes to answer your question as well. And please just stay there, the microphones are for the answering of questions. Um, well, let's get this show on the road, um, handing over to the expert of all things on transport. Uh, thank you. It's Tom Mellican from the City of Banyul. Um, thanks very much for coming tonight. We talk about mega projects and cars and um, what was said about electric vehicles may be true in reducing pollution, but that doesn't resolve congestion or parking issues. And we've seen during the pandemic how people have embraced riding their bikes all around, all across Melbourne. You can't buy a bike in Melbourne. We also know that 60% of trips are less than 5Ks across Melbourne. So why can't we do, as the City of Melbourne have bravely done, and roll out safe cycling infrastructure right across the whole city so we can actually get this, get this what people want to do, make it safe. It helps in so many ways, public health, so many benefits of improving, being more active, and yet we're putting money into these mega projects and some of those are reducing of people's safety and ability to ride. So for all these reasons, why don't we put in significant money to make it safe to ride a bike in Melbourne? Thank you, Tom. Uh, we might just have a quick answer from each in terms of the view. We'll start with you and then we'll go the reverse order next time. So well, Jacinta, over to thanks, you. Thanks, Tom. Well, the answer is we do and we are. In each of those mega projects or indeed the smaller and medium sized projects, each and every one of those projects is planned uh, to include walking and cycling connections. And Tom, I know you know the North East Link project very well. That's a project that has 34 kilometres of walking and cycling paths uh, that is being built as part of that project. Each and every level crossing removal, each and every suburban road uh, upgrade that we're undertaking has as part integrated into the project, and this is a great example of integrated transport planning, it has embedded in the project planning and delivery walking and cycling connections. The Westgate Tunnel Project has a dedicated valet for people who like to travel at faster speeds to get in and out of the city as a commuter cyclist. But we also need to remember that walking and cycling, as you say, also has to be accessible for parents, mums walking their kids to school. And the upfield line level crossing removal uh, provided for the first uh, separated walking and cycling uh, pathway as part of removing those uh, dangerous and congested level crossings in inner Melbourne. So my argument back to you, Tom, is very clearly, is, in, in, is that why aren't we doing it? Is that we are. It's embedded in each and every one of our projects. We don't see it as a separate part of our work. We don't have it tucked away in a different part of the, the department or the work we do as a government. It's embedded in each of every one of those projects. And uh, in many instances, it's also, whether it's level crossings, roads, we're connecting bike paths to each other because of the investment we're making. Thank you. Matt. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Tom. And look, I do agree with you. I think we need to be doing more to encourage active transport. I used to work before I came into Parliament just two years ago in your part of the world. I was the head of a large secondary school in Ivanhoe and I was so lucky because I could ride my bike. <coughs> I lived just over the other side of the freeway and there was a great path along the creek. So my wife and I only ran one car. I was able to ride my bike or, or jog to work every day but I'm well aware that I was so very fortunate because that infrastructure was in place in the first place. Um, I take what the Deputy Premier says. I, I do agree with you that we can do more, um, uh, um, I won't be making, I'm sorry to let people down, but major policy announcements tonight necessarily, but my hope, Tom, is that uh, you have a look at um, our policies on active transport when they're released in the normal time uh, and in the normal way, and you'll see that we're proposing to do far more to seek to allow opportunities for people who don't want to be using their cars every day, and I think there are lots of people like that, to engage in active transport and use public transport. Thank you. Sam? Well, if I can speak to the, the absolute frustration of people, not only people who ride, but all those people in their communities who want to ride but feel it's unsafe to do so. And that extends uh, communities right across metropolitan Melbourne and regional cities as well. Uh, and what's really, you know, we don't you don't need to build a, a multi-billion dollar freeway to put in a decent bike lane. Uh, and I think that's where the, the government's argument about uh, incorporating them into major projects falls down. That's good that you, you know, if you, 
I'll say, I'll, I won't call it greenwashing, but you know, it's good that you're putting those in, in addition whilst you're widening the road. Uh, but what's really needed is that uh, clear, consistent funding. And I'd love to see cycling and walking infrastructure being funded just like one of these major projects. Not just a, a few million every budget, but billions uh, and a clear plan. And I can tell you that would stack up on a cost benefit ana analysis, uh, both uh, uh, health, environmental, economic benefits, far more than any of these other major projects. And so we need yeah, the funding and a clear plan uh, to get active in. That would really be a city shaping uh, project uh, in this city, in this state. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Justin and I'm from Preston. Uh, I'm part of a group who are st stakeholders for the four level crossings being removed uh, on the Mernda line here within the marginal uh, Northcote electorate. For four years now, we have attempted to undertake serious engagement with yourself, Minister Allen, the LXRP, and our local member about the project. We have written letters, submitted petitions, had meetings, but at no time whatsoever have we had a considered and detailed response to our questions and concerns. Our calls to consider a viable alternative of taking access to Bell Station car park from the west have been disregarded without reason or due process. Even the questions that have been asked in Parliament by three different members have been rebutted without any attempt to address the issues raised. Indeed, it was only through a free Freedom of Information request that we learned how no Western access option to Bell Station was ever assessed. And shockingly, that no detailed safety analysis between active transport users and motor vehicles at dangerous points throughout the precinct was addressed. The present plan is not only unsafe for all road users, but it goes against the main reasons for lifting the rail in the first place, namely the mitigation of traffic congestion and the improvement of road safety. We urgently ask you to simply move car park access to the western side of Bell Street for the benefit of all commuters, local residents and businesses. And finally, to meet with us personally so that we can demonstrate this viable, safer alternative. Good. Well, we'll just see if Jacinta's got... It's a very detailed question. Uh, I think your point is very well made. Um, and we'll just ask Jacinta, are you going to answer this now or take uh, it offline? Well, I think, um, and this is perhaps just into your frustration, I, I can't agree with the, the question, uh, the proposition of your question. And in, in part, it's... it's it's, it's the theme in terms of what we've been talking about tonight is needing, to, whether it's cycling and walking connections, different projects, we have engaged with the community. You may have a different view about the outcome of that engagement, but we have engaged with the community. In this case, this is the removal of four level crossings, as you say, on the Moonda line. We've looked at all the different needs of the community about how they access the train station. And the simple fact is not everyone can ride their bike to the train station. The car parking facilities are needed at, a, at the train station. And I think we, one of the challenges, again, we have from a broader perspective of government is we have to find space in our transport network for every, every, all different modes. Uh, walking, cycling, train, tram, um, road use as well. We have to balance that up. And so this all goes into the mix in terms of how we plan and think about the removal of dangerous and congestion congested level crossings and in your part of the world we're also creating new open space and building two brand new stations. But I do acknowledge that as part of that the final designs won't necessarily tick the box for everyone but I would put it to you that we have and, and as I can see you shaking your head and I did anticipate that my answer would not um, satisfy you here tonight but we've looked at all of these issues and we need to get on and remove those level crossings and make sure that we can have um, parking facilities at a train station that are accessible. All right. Um, no, I think, with I respect, think... Minister, if you had actually engaged with us, you would understand that we're not opposed to a car park. We understand that some people need to travel by car to the train station. It is simply a matter of access to the car park that that's, in, that's inappropriate. Okay. And I think points well made and we've got a few more questions and encourage you to pick those up with the Minister uh, after this. Thank you very much. Next question. Uh, hello. Um, I'm Nathan. Uh, I'm on an income of $60,000. As such, that means that if I wanted to buy an electric vehicle, I could not get one unless I worked for an entire year. As such, by saying that, as a Green member of the Greens Party, that you are focused on people on low incomes and people who are, you know, want to um, be good for the climate, saying that an EV tax uh, should be reduced is wrong because it only costs $200 a year. 
I know this because my cousin has a Tesla. He lives in Gippsland. He is, he's on a farm, and he does not, he, that tax did not factor into anything about when he purchased that vehicle. Now, secondly, to get to work for my $60,000 a year job, it will take me an hour and a half by public transport. I have moved four times, and now I live in Knox. Every single time, I've always had to travel at least an hour and a half to get to university, school, or to work. Honestly, at this point, it's pretty unacceptable that this is still the case. In fact, one of the problems with Knox is that there is a bus that is, literally has two trips in the afternoon. Useless. Absolutely useless. It was quicker for me to get to work when I lived in the country at an hour than it is here where I am. So I'm now forced to drive to the station in my 15-year-old petrol car to a car park, uh, the station of car park, when I should really just be able to take the bus. That is why the car park is filled at 7.30 every morning. Nathan, good. Yeah. I think you've made your point. I've uh, got to get better at sorry. sharing here. Yeah, uh, so, sorry, I just to get to my question, I would just like to say, <laughs> what are all these parties going to do about, uh, you know, um, just... Mainly just frequency of transport Public services. transport. Okay, good. Well done, Nathan. Yeah. Thank you. Starting with you, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, on the EV tax, uh, it's not necessarily a barrier to those who are very wealthy and they're already going to be able to afford it. It's for those people who are on the margins, who may be considering, and we know that 60% of people uh, considering buying a car want their next car to be an EV. It's those people on the margins who already face barriers in terms of price, in terms of charging, um, in terms of the range of models. And this is just another barrier at a time we're in a climate crisis. Now, on uh, Tuesday, uh, the Greens put forward our first transport policy for this election, uh, which was the manufacturing of 3,000 electric buses to create high-frequency uh, electric bus routes across sit the entire city and in regional cities as well. Uh, and I certainly think that that's a way uh, that people out in the suburbs can then uh, access public transport, get the increased frequency and really make sure that we've got a transport system that meets everyone's needs. Good, Sam, thank you. Um, I'm just going to see if Matt or Jacinta want to talk. Well, I think Jacinta covered frequency in her opening comments, but Matt? Could I just make a comment or two about that? Thanks so much for your question, Nathan. I agree with you that, that frequency is key, and I think especially with our bus services, there's so much that we can do. All my advice is that, especially when you look at frequency on, on major arterials, well, you could do far more to allow accessibility for far more people, especially people living in our outer suburbs. So I think in addition to significant reforms when it comes to our bus routes and the frequency of certain routes, I think we need to look at the extension of, of tram lines. Uh, buses are fantastic and provide great flexibility. Trams obviously have far greater capacity. Uh, also issues, as I said in my initial comments, around uh, electrification and duplication because I do fear that over a long period of time, and this is something that I think has, has been the case under uh, different types of governments. We haven't had the focus that we should have had in growth corridors and in outer suburbs, particularly in our western suburbs as well, which I know is not where you are. You Thank like you. That? Jacinta? Uh, I think, Nathan, you've made a pretty compelling argument for the suburban rail loop. Like, this is exactly why we need the suburban rail loop. So we are providing an orbital train connection that will increase frequency of services. It will provide for more connections and it'll bring those train stations, more train stations, closer to where people live. I think um, you've made a, a really compelling example of why um, the further you get away from the heart of the city, whether you're in the, the, the suburbs, you, I think you said you're in, in Knox, you know, the, the east and going further out to the outer east or coming from country Victoria, it's why we need different access points for the rail network in particular because that is the most accessible form of transport you don't need big dollars to buy a fancy electric vehicle. You don't, you know, you, you don't have to have the, the challenge of get paying, putting petrol in your car. Public transport is incredibly accessible and that's why I'm so passionate about seeing the expansion of the rail network across our state for city and country. Good. Nathan, thank you for your question. And just noting we've got a long line now, so if we can keep our questions to a minute, that would be great and maybe get, um, get to the question as quickly as possible. It would be fantastic. Go for it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my name's Anders Axelson. I have a question for the Deputy Premier about the funding of the suburban rail loop. Congratulations on your elevation to Deputy Premier. Um, the business and investment case for the suburban rail loop is very vague on how the project is to be funded, but it does suggest that one third is to come from the state. 
one third from the Commonwealth and one third from value capture arrangements, but it is vague as to exactly what this, these value capture arrangements entail. It suggests um, increases in stamp duty near the um, station precincts and the local car parking taxes and a few things like that. But it does seem to me that we are talking about 12 to $15 billion worth here, being about a third of the project. And so I'm wondering if you could um, elaborate on has the, funding develop, has the funding model been developed a bit more since the business case or... Um, Thank you. And sorry, I missed your name at the start. Anders. Anders. Thank you, Anders, for your, for your question. And Anders, if you go back to almost four years ago to the day when we announced um, our commitment to the suburban rail loop and released a detailed strategic assessment, from the get-go, when we committed to this project, we said that it would be funded, uh, as you are clearly well informed, uh, as you said, it would be funded a third from state um, revenue, uh, state um, budget, a third from federal budget and a third from non-government revenue. And you've actually, I would argue, um, through your question, demonstrated that the business case actually does provide quite a bit of detail on those uh, some of those non-government uh, revenue sources that you touched on in your, your question. Uh, we also, um, as, as part of that, the reasoning behind that was because this is a project that brings $58 billion in economic, social and environmental benefit to the state. So we think it's reasonable that there's a con why there's a contribution from the federal government and why it was so fantastic to see Anthony Albanese commit uh, two point, an initial $2.2 billion. He's called it the most exciting transport project in the country, which is great to have that endorsement from the Prime That's Minister. That's a long way short of the $15 billion. No, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging that, but I'm, what I'm saying is that we've always said from the outset Set, that this would be a project that would be funded th from those three sources. We have laid out a blueprint in the business and investment case, which you're clearly quite familiar with, about those uh, non-government revenue sources. And we said at the time we released the business case just on 12 months ago that, yes, further work was being done on that and continues to be done, and that involves consultation with um, various parts of the community. And Thank it sounds you. like that's the bell. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, Councillor Sahana Ramesh from Wyndham City Council. Uh, the 2018 Western Rail Plan spoke of two new metropolitan lines to Melton and Wyndham Vale, separating them from Geelong and Ballarat V-Line regional services. This would give the growing western suburbs the much needed frequent high capacity services while also improving the experience of regional rail customers. It also talked of the potential to link Wyndham Vale to Werribee and create the western end of the suburban rail loop. Can the minister confirm progress on delivering this plan, the current scope and commitment? Can the other candidates outline their plan for rail services to the growing suburbs of the west? Let's go ahead, um, minister. Yeah, go on. Um, thank you, Sohana, for your, your question. Um, look, I'm really pleased that, to have the opportunity to give you an update on the tremendous amount of project progress on the, the Western Rail planning. And I actually think transport planning is pretty exciting. I don't find it boring at all. It's a dynamic thing that we have to keep working really hard on in reflection of what's changing in the community at the time. That's why it uh, needs to be a, dy a dynamic process in terms of how you plan and deliver improvements to road and rail. Uh, with the Western Rail Plan, the work that's been done since then, what has fallen out of that already is the um, commitment to the Melbourne Airport, and which is effectively a new train line for the Western suburbs and that will bring also more frequency to uh, services in the in the western suburbs. The, the, also, the, out of the planning work, and you've mentioned the separation of the Geelong and Ballarat lines, we always said that the Geelong, uh, because of population reasons and geographic proximity, that Geelong would be the first cab off the rank uh, in terms of the, where the work would be done. And we've uh, committed with the federal government to the Geelong Fast Rail Project, which is about getting faster services to Geelong, but also it will bring uh, more train services for the western suburbs as well. And so as we plan each plan and move projects particular subcomponents of the plan into delivery we are make sure we make sure that in the planning each project builds on the one that goes before it that's dynamic integrated transport planning uh, that we need to also take into account the circumstances of the time when we committed to the western rail plan in 2018 
we never saw the 2020 pandemic. And so we've also had to input that into the thinking of the delivery of rail services for the, for the growing western suburbs. Thank you. Matt. Thanks very much, and thanks, Councillor. I was actually out just last week meeting with the mayors of both Brimbank and Melton and other senior representatives of those councils to talk about a range of things, including the Western Rail Plan, and they were keen to see things move along more quickly. My view is that there is much merit in the Western Rail Plan, uh, the extension of lines in particular, and my hope is that when you see our full suite of policies that you'll see a, a very significant commitment to the growing western suburbs. You referred to the suburban rail loop and I'll just uh, reference back to, to Anders' point as well. The councillors that I met with last, last week were um, uh, unsure as to why uh, more of the uh, planned investment in the west um, would take so long. To, to, to come on board, and I do agree with what Anders said earlier, that there's a need for far greater scrutiny of that business case, and I would have had that business case uh, submitted to Infrastructure Australia long ago. Now, this used to be the view of senior members of the Andrews Labor government. Mr Bakula, previously the Attorney General, said this in 2015. Imagine what those opposite, meaning the Liberal Party, would say if the Labor Party proposed a project that we refused to submit the business case on to Infrastructure Australia. This business case has never been submitted to Infrastructure Australia. It, it was put forward by the Andrews Labor government over 1,400 days ago. He said, those opposite, the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party would accuse us of economic vandalism and they would be right. And they would be right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Sam, talking about uh, services, yes. rail services in the well, West. Yeah, well, I can absolutely hear your frustration that a plan that was announced with big fanfare, I think, near an election, and suddenly there's been a complete lack of information uh, from the government, no timeline when that can actually occur. Uh, the Minister referred to uh, dynamic integrated transport planning. And I'm sure to many communities that just feels like making it up as they go along and not having clear timelines for when these projects that have been announced or uh, put out into the public domain are actually going to occur. Um, in terms of where uh, the Greens certainly see some real short-term opportunities for uh, transport in the West or rail in the West, I certainly think increasing rail frequency, particularly during the day, uh, I think where it'd be line, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 20 minutes waits during the day. There's absolutely no reason why that couldn't be even halved uh, so people can actually use the train uh, not waiting around at train stations for 20 minutes during the day. Uh, and then I think we really need to get that planning started, the fast tracking of Melbourne Metro too, which of course will just have massive benefits to the West uh, and the Werribee line. Thanks, Sahana. Thanks everyone for your responses. All right, next question, welcome. Thank you, uh, my name is Andrew Carrasco. I'm a uh, spokesperson for the Drop Punt Community Group. Uh, we represent the uh, residents along Punt Road that are affected by the uh, 1954 uh, public acquisition overlay uh, to widen Punt Road. Uh, now, it's coming up to 70 years, and uh, in 2014, at the election, uh, we received a commitment from the Labor Party to say uh, that uh, they would uh, convene a ministerial, ministerial advisory committee uh, to discuss or to, to go through the... Uh, the issues. That was done um, and uh, shockingly the advisory um, uh, panel actually found in the uh, residents' favour. Uh, it recommended to the government that the uh, public acquisition overlay almost entirely be removed. Uh, we received support from all of the surrounding councils, the Greens, obviously Sam, and the Liberal Party, which had had bipartisan support on that, and uh, and Labor had uh, was supporting us before the election. After the election, uh, it simply handed down a uh, a finding of we're going to keep the overlay because Vic Rhodes tells us we we should. Minister Vic Rhodes was one of the was one of the parties You're that was supposed for... to be one of the independent uh, p uh, parties in the in the process, and it. It ended up becoming so we're looking judge, for jury, and executioner, and accused. Yeah. So we'd like to invite the government down to Punt Road to have a lunch and to discuss this because we have been stonewalled for five years. Do you want to wait until after the election? No. Right. Okay. Absolutely not, because we believe that actual um, some some of the infrastructure projects that are ongoing at the moment have changed 
the right. circumstances around Punt Road and we believe we have a lot of ideas, a lot of good ideas okay. in terms of housing, transport and so respect, on. With all due respect, I think we've got the, the picture and mm. we're over your time and I think that um, so I'd just it's like about to, a yep. lunch uh, with the group. Yeah. And I think just a yes or a no at this point, Minister. I'm going to have to take that one on notice because um, whilst I am aware of the, some of the history with this, the, I, I, I know this will sound like I'm to use another football analogy, handballing it across. The the process you referred to was one that was run through the planning processes, the, the, the planning Correct. department, the planning yes. minister. So I will need to go back and check. Well, I don't need to check. I, as you say, I am aware that that report was handed down and that was the response. In terms of any further activity on that from a planning end, I will need to go back into government and check on uh, the current status of that. I'm okay, afraid well, I don't have an answer but, for you tonight. We, we'd just like to be listened to. I mean, yeah, we, we've right. been stonewalled for five years. We, we set aside yep. two years of our time. Uh, the government set aside millions we, of dollars. I think uh, we to, understand uh, to, the situation, yeah. and I'm but, sorry, with all due just, respect, I know, and I know a lot of people have the same frustrations uh, we've heard tonight, but we've got, uh, we've got a lot of people behind you, and, sure. and we've had your time. It's just a meeting. That's all we're asking for. Yeah, I understand. That's all I hear we're asking for. It's noted Can I, by the, Deputy the Premier, minister. Please, just quickly. Okay. Can Very I just quickly, quickly speak yep. to that? You know, it's a, an overlay that's been on there for 70 years. Uh, when it was first uh, uh, looked at uh, as part of that planning panel process, uh, even Vic Road's own figures said that widening the road just wouldn't stack up. Uh, then they had to have another go at it uh, mm. to try and come up with some numbers that would actually somehow make it work. And it, just, it, was, it was just ridiculous. Uh, and it's holding back that whole area. The mm. idea of Vic Roads sitting on these bits of land for decades mm. uh, that now just sit there, uh, it's absolutely ridiculous, ridiculous that overlay needs to go. Okay. And that, uh, Matt? Uh, thanks. And, and just briefly from me... I'd hear the um, frustration in your voice, Andrew. On a, the, the, the broad issue here is about engagement with local communities, and we heard also um, uh, a frustrated question from Justin earlier regarding the LXRA. Um, I think there is, on that front, some need for significant reform of the well, way that the LXRA operates to make sure that we don't see a repetition of issues in Parkdale, Surrey Hills, Preston, where local communities who started off, I think, in a position of much goodwill towards the government and keen to see those level crossings removed, but nonetheless have felt, as Justin felt earlier on, like they hadn't been listened to. So this is a uh, theme, Andrew, that I hear as I move, uh, as I move around the state. Good. Thank you and thank you, Andrew. Um, look, we've got 16 minutes left for questions and we've still got about 10 people in the line. So if you could state your question clearly and uh, we'll look for an appropriate person to respond. Thank Go you. ahead. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My name is Sebastian. I work as an engineer for a major contractor. I work in rail. I have many questions to ask, but I'll only ask one, and it's an important one. So all this talk of electric cars and, uh, and all this and, uh, and all this stuff we can do for the city, I feel that... Uh, what we haven't heard enough of is what we're going to do about rail freight because uh, one car of rail freight can take a lot of trucks off the road and they cause a lot of congestion. Uh, Jacinta, as a regional MP, the regional rail revival is being good from what I heard, but we need uh, more on freight. And we all understand how bad the uh, Murray Basin rail project has been. So... One, can Thank we fix you. that? And two, also more importantly, what more can all three parties, plus the minor parties, can do to boost rail freight to optimise the amount carried by trains to make sure we can get as many as quickly as possible, in and out of the city and all that. Sebastian, thank you. Thank I you. think we've got the two questions, and thank you so much for being here tonight to participate. Just a quick response uh, on the importance of rail freight to, to each of you. Matt? Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, thanks, Sebastian. Um, first and foremost, I think there needs to be a thorough plan in partnership between the state government, whoever that's led by and whatever the composition may be, and the federal um, government to move forward on the whiffed and the biffed. Um, now, I had an understanding of the, the funding offering and the partnership arrangements being put forward by the previous coalition government. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote to Minister King on her very first day, the Federal Infrastructure Minister uh, in the Ministry, to congratulate her, but also to seek to meet with her 
to specifically have these discussions about freight. Yep. Because I agree with you, there are such bottlenecks as so many trucks in particular come into the port. I was at the site of the proposed WIFT uh, last week and I think there is so much merit in those proposals. Now they're very expensive yep. and given the state of the Victorian budget, my view is it's just not possible for any Victorian government to move ahead alone. That would need to be done in partnership with the federal government. That's what I would be seeking to do and I'm looking forward to meeting with Minister King shortly to discuss that with her. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a terrible shame, Matthew, that you didn't write to the former oh, Liberal Minister about don't. getting uh, freight uh, up and going because we have been knocking on the door of the previous federal government for years about getting the WIFT moving. For years, the Andrews Labor government done? has said that uh, the WIFT is the site for the intermodal freight terminal. We pushed and pushed and pushed. And unfortunately, this is an example, Sebastian, where politics did get in the way and the former Liberal government, for their own reasons, uh, just would political reasons about the complications with the Inland Rail project. I reckon you know a bit about that yes. as well and the problems with that project. They just could not get past the politics and partner with us on getting the WIFT moving. And so I'm thrilled. I've already met with the Minister, Minister King. We're getting um, having conversations about how to get WIFT moving. And in the meantime, your point about the rest of the network, in regional Victoria there is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars being invested right now yes. in upgrading the rail freight network work in regional Victoria. The Murray Basin project yes. had a, has had something like $800 million invested in that project and is having benefits now and it's continuing, um, there's work continuing on that project but that's not the only freight lines that we're investing in oh. in regional Victoria. Oh, and we've no. also got to think about how that freight gets into the city which is why the level crossing removals are also important. Yes, it's good. good. And Sam? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, oh, look, and Sebastian, I'll, you should yep. chair this. Well done. Particularly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks um, one minute. Um, okay. Um, uh, you know, we hear a lot, particularly from residents within the in the West and in the inner, inner West, about uh, just how difficult it is uh, with so much freight and trucks and pollution uh, traffic moving through uh, their communities. Uh, I'd put two. I'd put two uh, things on the table. Mm -hmm. One is uh, long-term uh, commitment for the mode shift incentive scheme. I think that's been. Mm -hmm. uh, I think been short-term funding and I think extended, uh, but creating a lot of uncertainty out there within the industry itself. Uh, and I'd also put on the table uh, what I feel is important when it comes to inland rail uh, and the port, and it's important that I think that that direct connection uh, is planned for and uh, delivered at some point, because uh, my understanding is that they may be able to use uh, with the uh, the WIFT, as it's, uh, I didn't realise that was a, an acronym being used until tonight, no, but did uh, I. they might be able to use existing existing rail networks. I think it will need its own dedicated rail network. No problem. Thank I'll say you, one thing Sebastian. before I sit. I hope you all uh, consider rail free in your party's policies in the upcoming election. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Anna. Hmm. Thank you. Anna Chen, uh, Councillor of Manningham City Council. Um, my question is uh, about Suburban Rail Loop, and Suburban Rail Loop is a big project. That means it also takes time to deliver. And uh, Manningham is very happy to have finally have a rail and a rail station at Doncaster, but that also means that the opening will be around uh, 2043, and another two decades. So in the meantime, we are very practical. We are advocating for uh, express bus routes that mimic suburban rail loop, that link uh, Monash University, Deccan, and up to La Trobe University, that help our students, uh, uh, university students, independence, and also and assist our workers to go around about and reduce uh, car dependency and also uh, reduce emission. Thanks, Anna. I would like to know speakers' view about an uh, express bus rules and will you support the delivery of an express bus good. rules? Thank well, you. I think that's a yes or a no response from each of that you. That is easy. Yeah, yes, good. Sir. A yes or a no yep. to an express bus. Very route. happy to look at it. I will put in a plug for the express busway that we're building as part of the North East Link project, which you would also know very much uh, about. Yes. And you know what? Doncaster Rail has been promised a lot and it's going to take 
um, only the Suburban Rail Loop and the Andrews Labor Government to deliver it. I remember a previous Liberal Party commitment in 2010 to do, suburban, uh, to do a rail line to Doncaster. They even did a business case and then popped it on the shelf and tucked it away because it was all too hard and it never got delivered. So I appreciate you want um, the benefits sooner and uh, I'm happy to have, uh, have a further follow-up uh, discussion about the uh, express busway, which is obviously over and above the investments we're making in public transport in the Manningham area. Good. I have Matt, your commitment and make um, an appointment with Anna, you. Anna, good. Yes. Yeah, Matt? Yes, and I think um, BRT is, is such a, a cost-effective, flexible way forward, especially in areas where um, over a long period of time we, we, we haven't seen the sort of investment in, in rail and tram networks that you'd like to see. I started my working life in Doncaster, actually, and sat on buses for, for many hours. Uh, more express bus services, especially utilising designated lanes on arterial roads, I think is a a really cost-effective, evidence-based way forward. I think that sounds like a yes, Anna. Uh, Sam? I think it's yeah. a terrific idea. I've, so, I've certainly been aware of a number of campaigns and a lot of advocacy to uh, realise the benefits of Suburban Rail Loop earlier, and that means you know not waiting for the, the decades of the construction, but actually getting some buses uh, on the road uh, to mimic that route and uh, other orbital routes. And so, yeah, I think it's certainly a worthy... A worthy idea. Good. Terrific. Point I've well made, Anna. All, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, I'm looking at time, and I'm so sorry. I think we're only going to have time for two more questions. So I think for our remaining people that have stood all of this time, and I, I am so sorry, if you could send your questions to the MTF and they will get responses. Um, well, let's see how we're going, if you want to keep standing. Um, but let's keep going. We've got these two, definitely. Go for it. Hi, how's it going? Um, I'm a railway infrastructure engineer, but my questions are going to be about buses. Um, first off, has a school bus program been considered? Because there's a considerable difference about driving around Melbourne when school's on and when school's not on, and it just seems like low-hanging fruit just to get rid of that traffic. Um, the second one is around trams and traffic light prioritisation. I see lots of T-lamps sitting in infrastructure at intersections, but they're never switched on. Um, yeah. Okay, What's sound there? very technical. So school bus and uh, then I assume the... you mean using school buses in school holiday times. Uh, sorry, no, as in during school times. Oh, during the school day, yeah. yes, yep. yes. Um, yes, and that um, there has been some... Oh, this is going to get a bit technical. Okay. We, we did some bus know. contract reform that has given us greater flexibility. Um, I should also note that one of the reasons why we do a lot of our rail disruptions during school holidays is so we can use those school buses for bus replacement um, right. project, uh, for, for, the, for those projects. And Good. on your tram traffic light prioritisation, that is part of the, um, the Smart Roads program that's being rolled out through the Roads Minister's portfolio across uh, three different regions in Melbourne about how we use technology to better move traffic and that includes a, a bunch of different things but it also in terms of cameras and, um, and, and in terms of getting Bluetooth information into vehicles it also includes the traffic light prioritisation in those locations. Good. Uh, any other comments on that? They were oh, quite particular. Just very, very quickly, I'd say I think it makes sense, actually, that you asked your two-part yep. question Sorry. together. Yep. No, no, I, I genuinely think it makes sense, and therefore I think it's, it's another reason why it's so important that in Victoria we have an integrated transport plan, and I'd repeat my assertion from my opening remarks that, that in a plan like that there are actually a, a range of things that can be done, again, in a cost-effective way, focusing, as the Deputy Premier said, on, on things like greater use of technology, signalling to ultimately deliver really good outcomes. Good. Sam? Yeah, two-part question. One, I'll just speak the benefits of electric buses and the ability for them, I think, to really uh, elevate buses to be on par with trains and trams. I think we're going too slow here in Victoria, only around 50-odd due by 2025. New South Wales is racing ahead. We need to get the investment now, particularly in upgrading the depots. Uh, and in terms of tram prioritisation, you know, I really feel like we were getting somewhere maybe 10 years ago with the uh, plans for Route 96, and I think it was going to be 86. In terms of really reforming the entire corridor to have the greater separation, the um, upgraded accessible tram stops uh, and traffic light priority, and that seems to have just fallen in a heap. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your question. Very interesting. Uh, last question. Here we go. Last question. Sheikh Rahman from Tarnit, Victoria, uh, 3029. Uh, a rapidly growing suburb like Tarnit in Wyndham Council seems to be left behind by our governments. Even though there are opportunities for more station as per the West Growth Corridor Plan on an electric metro circular line, as uh, our councillor has just mentioned, there has been no funding commitment for uh, even a few more V-line stops. 
Uh, west is a beautiful and unique region. We have the one and only uh, open range Jew uh, of Melbourne in Urabi. Uh, and uh, other tourist attraction nearby. We have the beautiful shallow depth seawater attraction, good for families in Williams Landing and Altona. However, current public transport seems to fall short in providing frequent and adequate transportation. Why, why do trams in the West stop in Footscray and not connect this attraction uh, with nearby city centres and uh, with uh, Greater Melbourne? Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you. Uh, do you want to start, Sam? Well, it does feel like uh, when new suburbs are planned or when uh, you, you know Melbourne is expanding out west, it seems like transport is often the, the last thing to, to go in place, if, if, if at all. Uh, and I think that really needs to be uh, reversed. Uh, and I think promises are often made by uh, developers or government agencies in terms of what community is going to be like, uh, and these never come to fruition. And so we need to reverse that. Transport needs to go in first. Uh, residents need to have the confidence that the promises were made about their communities are uh, delivered. Uh, we're seeing this not just in the outer suburbs, but Fisherman's Bend as well, uh, with massive population growth there, yet no commitment for uh, rail or tram services. Uh, so this it needs to be, uh, again, reversed. Transport needs to come first, not left to last or never delivered. I agree wholeheartedly with Sam, and I think, Sheikh, over a long period of time, under governments of all shades that the West has been shortchanged. Um, that's why I think the Western Rail Plan has, has so much merit um, and there should be a funding commitment to that plan and that should move forward. I agree with you on line extensions to trams, by the way. Um, and um, again, tonight, all I can say is that I'm having a series of, of meetings and discussions with, with interested stakeholders in the West right now and that as you see our plans, my hope is that you have a look at the Liberal plans when they're announced in the coming weeks. And if you don't think they're solid enough in the western suburbs, please come back to me because I agree with you utterly that politicians for too long have, I think, taken the West for granted. And whether it's in the West, growth corridors across the state, it's not good enough that people move to these areas with, with so little uh, infrastructure. And the West is, is booming across your area, um, across Melton, so many other parts of the West. Thank you, Matt. Jacinta, and then we're getting ready for your two-minute sure. summations. Well, Jacinta. I'm going to present a, a very different view. Um, it took a federal and state Labor government to deliver the regional rail link, which built the new stations at... Uh, the then new stations when they opened in 2015 in Tarnit and Wyndham Vale. And I, I do appreciate that there is enormous growth going on in the outer West and the challenge that places on our road and rail network. That is why we are investing, I think, at some something like $20 billion in the road and rail network in the western suburbs because you have to do both in terms of the way people are moving around, around the inner west. It's also why out of the um, western rail plan, it's, it's a plan that's being actioned. It's a plan that's being delivered and we've already started, as I said before, with the, with the, with the work on the airport rail, which will add the capacity for extra services, Geelong Fast Rail, which will give us the, addition, the opportunity to take some of that pressure off the Wyndham Vale line uh, and and also, too, we are adding, we've already added uh, longer trains on the Wyndham Vale line so we can carry more passengers. All of these projects need to build on the one that's come before them because otherwise you won't be able to get the end game, which is about being able to travel, have more people catch the train. All right, thank you. Thank you. I uh, think we, we know that commitment to the West and uh, certainly uh, and wanting to see um, those delivered. Uh, thank you for your question. Now, we are out of time and we are up to summation. Um, my suggestion would be uh, that you might have an opportunity um, after this, uh, after the summation, to uh, ask questions. And if you don't get to speak to the person you wanted to this evening, then you give questions to Greg and he can make sure that uh, you receive responses from the candidates uh, this evening. Yes, thank you. Uh, and really thank you for your patience. Thanks to everybody that has participated this evening. Uh, we've covered a range of issues and it's now time for us to hear two minute summation from each of the participants. And we're gonna start with you, Sam, um, just there if you want to, a two minute summation uh, of, um, of what you've learned this evening, reflections. Uh, well, I, I, I just, again, wanted to summarise what I uh, raised uh, in my uh, earlier remarks. Uh, thank you everyone for MTF for 
uh, hosting tonight and uh, all the work that councils and councillors are doing in regards to transport across this state. Uh, this is the critical decade for climate action. More Greens in Parliament uh, will mean that we can push the next government to go further and faster in cutting transport emissions. We need a strong voice in Parliament for climate-friendly, cheaper, accessible transport uh, with a clear transport plan, fre more frequent and accessible public transport, uh, greater uptake of electric vehicles and massively e increased funding in bikes and walking. Uh, I did, however, want to uh, raise one more point um, and leave you with something tonight. Tonight I wore in my uh, Met uh, badge, which I bought from a uh, store in uh, Union Heights in uh, Windsor in my electorate. And whilst uh, maybe even if we don't bring back the Met branding, which I do believe uh, we should, um, as a brand for our public transport network, I do believe that we should have a public transport system, in fact an entire transport system that is publicly run. We need to move away from this fantasy, this neoliberal fantasy that we should be putting private companies in charge of transport, whether that's planning transport like the, the Westgate Tunnel, uh, building it, operating, privatising big roads, selling off the port. Uh, with um, the pressing climate crisis, we need to put public transport, in fact all transport, back into public hands, run in the public interest for the public good. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Matt. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor, and thank you all for, for your wonderful questions and your engagement tonight and coming out. It's been great to, great to be here. Uh, Victoria needs more and better transport infrastructure. I think we could do that in a way that minimises some of the issues that we've seen in terms of, of waste and also mismanagement. Um, many years ago now, uh, Victorian politicians used to talk about um, embracing processes that depoliticised um, transport decision-making. Um, infrastructure Victoria was, was established. There was much discussion about the role for Infrastructure Australia. So I think that what we must do as we move forward is to re-engage fulsomely and properly with bodies like Infrastructure Australia as we put together an integrated transport plan. As the Minister quite correctly said in her opening remarks, there are so many challenges that we face, global challenges, but I agree with her, they cannot be used as an excuse to go slow, especially in the West, in the outer suburbs, in other growth corridors. There are significant areas of need. There are projects on the books with much merit, like Metro 2, that of course has a very significant price tag. And my view is that no government, no government is uh, expert enough, competent enough, is the proper entity to plan fully without independent expert advice and a proper planning process to work through that pipeline to deliver the needs of a complex and wonderful broader city like Melbourne. Thank you. Jacinta. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sally, and thank you to the, um, my opposition uh, colleagues here tonight. Look, what we've heard tonight is that only the Andrews Labor government can be trusted and have the confidence of the community to keep on delivering a transport infrastructure pipeline, a pipeline that supports thousands, tens of thousands of jobs, pay packets going home to families each and every week, but a program of work that builds on the one before it so we can have safer um, road trips, we can ha remove dangerous and congested level crossings, and we can get the investment whether it's the West, country Victoria, uh, the outer suburbs in the East like we've heard tonight, only the Andrews Labor government can, will be the government that can continue this pipeline of investment because quite frankly, you can uh, ultimately the job of being in government is you've got to make a decision. Yes, processes are important and we have strong and robust processes. We engage extensively with the community. We talk to experts. We have great engineers who work with us on our program. But ultimately, the responsibility of elected officials is to make a decision and deliver projects. I've talked about 165 projects tonight. The opposition can't even commit to one here tonight. So we are determined to keep on delivering our pipeline of projects and continue to work with the community, look at what needs to be built upon because it is all about supporting jobs. It's also about supporting a fairer 
community. Being able to get on that train closer to where you live means that you can get to your medical care quicker and more easily. It means you can have a tertiary or TAFE opportunity that you might not otherwise be limited by because you can't have that transport access. That's why we are going to keep on building is because it provides for a fairer, more equitable community when we have stronger transport connections. Thank you, Jacinta. Uh, well, it's been such an interesting night. Could we all please join together in thanking our participants this evening? <laughs> Jacinta, Matt and Sam, thank you very much. Thank you to Greg Day for his leadership and, uh, and support this evening, particularly to everybody from the Metropolitan Transport Forum. Thank you very much. Uh, for your work. Uh, to all of you for coming, this is what it's all about. Um, for those of you who still have questions, see if you can grab Jacinta, uh, Matt or Sam whilst they're here, but otherwise send those emails through and we'll get back to you. There are light refreshments this evening, so please stay and have a chat. And thank you all for being here at Melbourne Town Hall. Good night.